tonight, um, something very timely if you live in the United States. Uh, we are barraged with uh, uh, advertisement of a political nature. And it seems that uh, politicians, when it comes to the economy, uh, have one word, um, and that is the word growth. The only argument is which political approach offers the best pathway to growth. Tonight, we're going to invite you to think long and hard and deeply about the pro-growth mantra that seems to be so uh, powerfully in sway here in the United States and probably in all of the other countries that um, Maynard has just mentioned. So welcome everyone. In a moment, we're going to be listening to uh, Professor Dr. Brian Check, and he's going to be speaking with us on the interesting notion that maybe growth is not the answer, maybe growth is the threat. After uh, Brian speaks to us, we'll be going to a good friend, Saul Katz, good friend, of course, of Iris over the years, um, a, a brilliant scholar in uh, uh, anthropology, biological anthropology, many technical articles to his credit, but perhaps the most interesting is the uh, Encyclopedia of Food and Culture. Uh, so Brian will be making the first response to Brian, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Saul will be making the first response to Brian. Then we're going to uh, throw the conversation open and we invite everyone to submit questions. To do that, you uh, look down to the bottom center of the screen and down there you'll see a, a Q and A icon. Open that up. I see we already have one question in the queue but uh, there's gonna be room for many, many more. Simply type your question in, make it succinct, make sure it's a question and uh, not a um, dissertation. Uh, make sure it's uh, uh, directed to uh, Brian Check, and I'll field those questions and uh, pass them on to him and we'll engage in the conversation. Uh, so uh, as uh, Brian is speaking, feel free to ask your questions or perhaps immediately thereafter and we'll try to get them all in in so far as possible. Well like I said our guest tonight um, is uh, Brian Check, who uh, has already been introduced briefly as the director, uh, the founder and director of the Center for Advancement of Steady State Economics. Uh, he comes to that work from natural resources work in fact, you could describe it as natural resources economics, uh, the interplay between the way in which a society thinks about its resources and its economics life. He has uh, challenged conventional thinking through a series of books, uh, one called Supply Shock, or my favorite title, Shoveling Fuel for a Runaway Train. Uh, similar uh, books and uh, uh, journal articles and uh, website uh, uh, promotions over the years, uh, really with an international reach through the Center for the Advancement of Steady State Economics. Uh, international outreach and uh, the, uh, preparation of educational resources. He'll be describing uh, all of that uh, along the way in his talk but again, the center of what he's going to be arguing is to invite us to think deeply about our addiction to growth, our tendency to think that growth is the solution to our economic problems. So Brian, uh, we're ready for you. Uh, go ahead and switch on and, um, and uh, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. And Thank you, Maynard. Uh, it's really an honor to be able to address this distinguished group and uh, in such a distinguished series of talks. And I hope to, to be with the group next year at Star Island. Hopefully we're past you know, some of the, uh, the problems with the vaccinations and so on. Uh, well, speaking of, of that and some of the uh, the people involved, you know, I suppose it's apropos that the title of my talk this particular evening with the presidential debates later is uh, 
is what it is. And I'm going to bring up the slideshow right now. First, I have to uh, hit screen sharing. And there we should be. <clears throat> and now we'll go to the beginning. And so, yes, the title of my talk is It's the Economy, Friends, Putting Sacred Cows Out to Pasture. And <clears throat> I hope that, that nobody gets the impression from this slide that, that we're against cows or, or even against GDP, uh, but rather what we, yeah, in fact, you know, most cows are okay, <laughs> whether they're sacred or not, and GDP is okay. It's, it's GDP growth that's the sacred cow that we think needs to be put out to pasture. We don't want that. I mean, it's bad for all the other cows as well as that individual cow, and it certainly is bad for the pasture. So here is a little bit more on that. You know, we, we all realize that there's a limit to economic growth and that in, in ecology that's denoted by the K for carrying capacity. And of course, uh, degrowth isn't, isn't sustainable either. And so that leaves one alternative, the sustainable alternative that's called the steady state economy. <clears throat> It's not a flatlined economy. It can't, it can't be. Uh, hopefully it's mildly fluctuating without any severe shocks. And ideally it's fluctuating around some optimal size as well. And I think in any talk when, when economic growth is the topic, it really helps to remind ourselves exactly what that means because there's nothing magical or mysterious about it. Economic growth is simply an increase in the production and consumption of goods and services in the aggregate. And uh, it's typically in, expressed in terms of GDP or gross domestic product. And so it entails a, a growing population and or per capita production and consumption. The steady state economy then, that sustainable alternative well, it's all of those same things except stabilized instead of growing. There it is again. And uh, oh, and that helps to explain our, our very logo at Cassie. You see the, the sigmoid growth curve here and the steady state ensuing from then on. And, uh, you know, with about half of the earth left for natural natural ecosystems and biodiversity. And that's in contrast with how the process of economic growth is viewed in conventional economics and in particular in, in conventional or neoclassical economic growth theory. You've probably all seen in a basic business book or basic economics textbook, this production function that tells us that production is a function of capital and labor. And yes, it is, but it's leaving out a really important variable uh, and that's land. So we, we call this the landless production function. And if you think of production entirely as a function of capital and labor, and then you think of the process of economic growth, well, you, you, you model it like this. It's it's this basic circular flow of money between the factors of production and, uh, and the consumers. And, and then the money, you know, is going in the other direction for those. I mean, the factors like labor and the products from the firms. And so if, you, uh, if that's your vision of how the economy operates and you think about economic growth, well, then you just think about this ever expanding circular flow of money. And it's like, where does it stop, right? So what we do is we start in ecological macroeconomics, let's call it. We start with the planet Earth uh, and with the sun, 
And then we say, yes, humans evolved, humans were created. Uh, in any event, what happens then is the economy starts growing. And yes, it does have a circular flow of money and uh, but it, it requires the use of natural capital, the woods, the waters, the soils, and so on. And it must result in waste pursuant to the first two laws of thermodynamics. There will be waste. There will be material pollutants and waste heat. So that helps us to uh, you know, have a, a more holistic and more realistic view of the process of economic growth when we put it in the context of planet Earth. So yeah, we, we know that there's a limit to the size of the economy. The next question that we deal with oftentimes at Cassie is, well, are you sure then that that means a limit to GDP? Is that such a sound measure of the economy that that limit applies to GDP? And then, you know, we might even go a step further. We do go a step further and we say, since GDP is measured in dollars, well, is there a limit to the supply of, is there a limit to money, like real money supplies and flows? And so these are some of the things we'll be looking at. We'll start with that the bit about money, you know, money is a means of exchange, it's a unit of account, it's a store of value, and, and it exists in the economy as a stock and as a flow. So basically this is the money supply and the flow of money is, is GDP. That's the main flow we're concerned with. And GDP is the monetary value of all final goods and services produced annually within a country's borders. That's the normal, uh, the normal parameters for GDP. And it helps, it's gonna help us to think for just a moment then about the fundamental identity of national income accounting, which tells us that production is equals income equals expenditure. Those are the three main approaches to national income accounting, production, the income there from, and the expenditure thereon. Yeah, and, and, and not just on anything, but once again, on the final goods and services. Uh, so this, for example, doesn't contribute to GDP. And this is important for uh, for folks that may need a reminder about what GDP is or what national income accounting is, it's not every transaction out there. Uh, gambling in a casino, the pulling of that handle doesn't, doesn't uh, contribute to GDP. The wages of the casino employees, those do and a few other things. But uh, And same thing, you know, it's the trading of derivatives on, uh, on, the, on the floor, you know, that doesn't contribute to GDP either. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, the origins of money because like Aristotle said, he who thus considers things in their first growth and origin will obtain the clearest view of them. And we, want, we need a clear view to answer that question about whether or not GDP can be used as the metric for limits to growth. And so the origins of money, I think it's pretty well established in the anthropological literature that money originated, especially in Mesopotamia and, and Lydia in ancient Greece and China uh, in the form of shekels and electrum coins. Electrum is a, a natural alloy of gold and silver and copper coins in the Yellow River Basin of China from you know, 5,000 to like 20, 2,200 years ago. And, uh, and before that, there were forms of proto money, most famously the barley grains that originally comprised, 160 of which comprised the first uh, shekel, you might have called it. And uh, with she meant barley uh, in Sumerian. And uh, in Lydia, oxen were, were commonly used as proto-money and in China, cowrie shell and various imitations thereof. 
So let's go back a little bit further because we're looking at the origins of money. And it turns out that something else very important originated in these same three regions on earth. And that's agriculture. And this leads us then to something that we consider to be very important at Cassie, and we call it the trophic theory of money, which is that money originates via the agricultural surplus that frees the hands for the division of labor onto the manufacturing and service sectors. No agricultural surplus, no money. It's a meaningless concept, a meaningless concept money is until there's an agricultural surplus. Now, we call it, why do we call it the trophic theory of money? Because we're using a term from ecology where the economy of nature is, is uh, uh, recognized as having this structure of trophic levels. It starts with the producers at the base. This is the, these are three trophic levels. And trophic simply refers to the flow of energy and biomass as you proceed from one level to the next. The producers in the economy of nature are plants. They literally produce food in the process of photosynthesis. They produce for their own uh, growth and reproduction. And then there, if there is enough surplus plant production, well, then you can have a community of primary consumers. Those are the animals that directly consume the plants. And then with enough of them, you can have species of secondary consumers, which as they sound, they consume primary consumers. And then this is obviously a very simple uh, collection of three trophic levels. In reality, there, there are all kinds of intermediate levels. And of course you have omnivores that eat that eat consumers, oops, and producers. And then of course, in the economy of nature, there are some species that aren't so readily classified into trophic levels like scavengers and decomposers, uh, parasites. So these, but these are what we might call service providers in the economy of nature. And for that matter, a lot of these uh, species that are readily classifiable in trophic levels provide some ecosystem services as well, like pollinators. All right, uh, so the human economy follows the same basic rules and it has a trophic structure and it starts as well with the producers. These are the agricultural in particular, or especially the agricultural sector. But really we should put the extractive sectors down here as well. Uh, they sort of it's a natural gradation from agricultural into extraction activity uh, you know logging mining and so on and then when there's enough of this surplus uh, enough surplus with these activities then you can have manufacturing uh, most basically from the heavy manufacturing through the light manufacturing with all kinds of service providers in the human economy that serve consumers, but largely that serve these activities. So this is a very integrated economy. Oh, so, you know, I wanted to try at least to connect a little bit, both, well, maybe with what's happening this e later this evening, but also, of course, with the, you know, with, with the host. Uh, and, and so we might wonder, especially the folks in the Institute, on religion in an age of science. My gosh, what's it coming to the, is it really still, uh, is it religion in an age of science? Do we have an age of science anymore? Is it, is it starting to become religion helping science in some kind of age of ignorance? Because boy, the, a, lot of, a lot of scientists out there, and I know many in the audience are as well, we're just uh, beside ourselves with the, the lack of it. <laughs> so, and I, I wanted to bring this up because uh, the Pope's encyclical from a few years back, the Laudato Si', 
uh, which which uh, in praise in praise of you. Uh, and the first sentence in the Laudato Si, I can't remember the Latin, or but uh, it's you know in praise of you, O Lord, or something like that. And uh, I guess this is a, a, a version that was published in Portuguese. And in the Laudato Si, uh, Pope Francis called for research aimed at understanding more fully the functioning of ecosystems and for adequately analyzing the different variables associated with any significant modification of the environment and for a better understanding of how different creatures relate to one another in making up the larger units, which today we term ecosystems. And we're gonna be, we've looked at some things already like the structure and functioning in ecosystems with the trophic levels. And we're certainly gonna be uh, building upon that to help to answer these. And uh, with the economy of, yeah, so we talked about the structure of the economy of nature in trophic terms with energy and biomass flowing up the trophic levels. Same thing with the human economy. And, and we mentioned uh, the trophic theory of money. And so now the primary corollary of the trophic theory of money is that the quantity of money and GDP as a flow of money indicates the amount of agricultural surplus and related activity at the trophic base of the economy and therefore the environmental impact of the economy. So GDP is an indicator of the environmental impact of the economy. It may be the, the thing that it indicates best, but let's remind ourselves now uh, uh, that economic growth is an increase in the production and consumption of goods and services in the aggregate because that phrase often gets overlooked. And so then you may have people out there thinking that, well, you know, maybe we can just have more and more organic vegetables and less Roundup Ready soybeans and we can still have economic growth and it'll be green. Well, no, you know, economic growth is all about the aggregate process with that trophic structure. It's the growth of the integrated whole. It's, it's a macroeconomic process by definition. So here is what economic growth looks like. It's not, that, it's not that circular flow of money that goes out perpetually into, into nothingness. It, 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 has, uh, it has this trophic base and growth requires the expansion of that trophic base with the agricultural and extractive activity. So that's you know, been kind of a theoretical introduction. Now let, let's take some uh, take some looks at what that looks like on the landscape. Well, here's what it looks like in huge areas in North America by now with uh, soybean. Well, here uh, we also require a lot of uh, uh, liquidation of aquifers, the Ogallala aquifer, for example, to, uh, you know, to irrigate the crops. This happens to be a flyover of Kansas and all of those little uh, circles down there are uh, this on the ground, pivot agriculture. And in a lot of cases to, uh, to irrigate Roundup Ready soybeans or, and some other commonly uh, uh, grown crops that are very, uh, you might say very fragile ecosystems because they're just they're monocultures that take a tremendous amount of input in terms of energy and water and fertilizer, and there's hardly any biodiversity or resilience. This is the same thing uh, over one of the aquifers that's, that's being drained in Saudi Arabia. And here's what it looks like on the ground in that part of the world. Here's what it looks like on the ground just about anywhere where, where the aquifer starts to dry out and or where climate change uh, in the form of global warming and drying, as, which is one of the common effects of climate change over huge 
portions of the world. You have other effects in other areas like uh, higher rainfall actually, but in large areas, uh, it's the drought effect that goes with the higher temperatures worldwide and all the different meteorological effects of that. But, you know, I think the even more important point is it doesn't even matter so much uh, in though that it's what happens in dry areas. By now, uh, the world is so crowded with people and production that even in areas that we consider to have a lot of water, if you have any soil to speak of, you also have very crowded farming conditions and more industrialized and intensive. So uh, coming back to North America now, you know, we're looking at a few of the other sectors now, like domestic livestock production with all the overgrazing problems that causes, especially out west. And of course, the dairy business and all the water and grain production that takes in today's uh, industrial style dairy business with something like 60% of the water in California going for agricultural irrigation and feed production. And of course, you know, livestock production can be a very dirty, very heavy, heavily polluting business and uh, very disease prone business. And, uh, and then of course we have the logging sectors with the more, the more, of it, more of it we need as that trophic base expands, the more it tends toward activities like clear cutting. And of course the mining goes toward open pit type and mountaintop removal. Well, after there's plenty of that kind of activity, then we can have the heavy manufacturing and, you know, activities like this. And obviously these are very energy intensive activity, energy and material intensive activities. And that's what you get toward the trophic base of the economy. And we may as well include the infrastructure here. That's some, <laughs> that's some heavy manufacturing, right? To get the power transmitted uh, throughout that integrated economy with its various sectors and then out to the consumers and same thing with the water to be able to grow food in more places and to have towns and cities in more places and, and here's almost like a circular flow you might say the labor going one way and I suppose some of the products being trucked the other. Well after there's plenty of that heavy manufacturing and infrastructure then Yes, we have the light manufacturing. And uh, I don't, I'm not going to pretend to give you much of a cross section of that. Just, just a few slides that weren't copyrighted is about it. But there's all kinds of it by now, light manufacturing. Even the manufacturing of the light containers to ship the light to manufacturers. It's a huge business now. Just think all those Amazon boxes. And then on up the trophic structure, we go to some of the lightest manufacturing. There is the computer chip manufacturing and then the computer chip manufacturing sort of grades or gradades into the so-called information economy and services in general, including the information services. And this is sometimes used by uh, growth optimists as opposed to realists, sometimes used by growth optimists to make the claim that, well, since it's more and more just information we're buying, we're dematerialize the, dematerializing the economy. It's utter nonsense because this, these uh, information services mean nothing to GDP unless they're purchased. And what are they purchased for? Well, typically for, oh, I have in another slideshow, this one will expand and it'll show you these information sectors are just, they're going toward all the other sectors, like in this case, heavy extractive industry. And they may even be going straight to the energy sector. And this, you may actually consider the ultimate base in a sense. I like to consider agriculture the base because it has 
the producers, they, and they work hand in hand with plants, the producers in the economy of nature, but whatever, you know, you, you have to consider energy at least in that basic trophic level as well. It's, a, it's an extractive industry and, and, uh, and of course the hope is that more and more of it will come from these renewable types of operations. But uh, then you have to say to yourself as well, be careful what you wish for, because look what this is starting to look like. And it's only feeding a tiny percent of our uh, consumptive needs at this $20 trillion level in the USA and the $89 trillion, at least pre-COVID uh, GDP level globally. And then of course, as I alluded to earlier with the, in particular with the second law of thermodynamics, there will be a tailpipe, there, there will be pollutants. And the more and more you grow all these other things, you know, the more you grow that trophically integrated whole, the more pollutants you will have. May, it may not be on a precise, you know, linear, one-to-one uh, -one relationship, no, but there will be more in the gross. There will be more in the gross because of uh, the way thermodynamics operate and the way, well, we'll get into another aspect of this very soon. Uh, but I think it, it, we've been led already to understand that, yes, GDP is just an outstanding indicator of environmental impact, so much so that, you know, we could, we could, we could actually, you know, draw this carrying capacity line on over here as well and consider the limits to growth directly in terms of GDP. So now going back to the, our uh, vision of how the economy works on planet Earth, uh, we looked at this version, but really it's more like this. It's more like this, you know, it's this trophically structured economy that grows via the liquidation of natural capital and uh, concomitantly with increased pollution. All right, well, some would say, but what about technological progress? Can't we uh, you know, make things ever more efficient? So we get more and more by using less and less or by using even the same amount. Well, let's take a look at that. And I wanna say that this is one of the, the least investigated, written about, researched, thought about issues out there. I, I had to spend years looking for the answer of why, why, the, why the answer to this in real systematic terms is no. And so here it is in, a, in the tiniest of nutshells and you can, uh, a couple of my books were mentioned earlier by Ron and, and by Maynard and the one called Supply Shock does tell you about this as well with a little more detail. But yeah, technological progress is a very uh, institutionalized process these days. It's not like manna from heaven. It, it's a, a function of research and development. Well, how does that happen? That takes, that takes financing. And uh, in the private sector, it takes profits. First, you have to pay off the factors of production, uh, the rents and, and the wages and the interest. And, uh, and then, it, you know, if you wanna have some sort of uh, dividends or, or a, a corporate party in Scottsdale, Arizona or something like that, it's only after all that stuff, you may have something left to put into R&D and if in the public sector you collected taxes, a lot of it which came from the profits, then you know you can put it that from that direction as well. The problem is that profits are very uh, uh, delicate in an economy. They dry up as populations grow and labor gets cheaper and so on. You know, in a growing economy, in other words, and so we have to go a level deeper. What allows this relationship between R&D and profits? Because it takes the R&D to maintain the profits, but it takes the profits to maintain the R&D. And 
this should actually show kind of a catch 22 uh, situation here. I don't know what happened to that slide, but the answer to this is that there is one more layer of depth that we need to inspect. And that's gonna tell us what maintains this, uh, this the cycle of profits and research and development. And it's called economies of scale. And uh, I was really excited when I, I uh, ran across the contribution of economies of scale to GDP at the national level as relayed by uh, that economist, W.W. W. Rostow. Uh, he was relaying the, some of the work of Edward Dennison who was like the greatest national income accountant of all time. <laughs> but anyway, this is, these are what economies of scale are. They're simply reductions in average cost of product resulting from increased level of output. Well, what that, uh, you know, these occur with existing levels of technology. There's no new technology yet. It's based on what we have now. So yeah, it's, there's increased efficiency but concomitantly, not just concurrently, but concomitantly with an increase in aggregate throughput. And here's, uh, this isn't aggregate, but here's an, a micro e economic example. Uh, you know, which one of these is more efficient? Well, of course it's this in terms of the tonnage per, per unit energy tonnage shipped per unit energy converted, you know, it's way more efficient. Does that look more sustainable than this? Well, of course not, because it just goes to show us that sustainability is ultimately a matter of the size of the economy. It's not ultimately a matter of efficiency because you can't get past the laws of thermodynamics. All right. Uh, and by the way, I got to refer once more to Pope Francis and the Laudato Si because he was real big in the Laudato Si and in um, warning us about uh, an inappropriate level of, of optimism about technology. He said we need to be having a, a keener sense of uh, critique about technology and take some and leave some. In fact, uh, it's been a while since I read it, and I didn't read it cover to cover. I read parts of it very thoroughly, and I perused the rest. And I did leave that uh, effort thinking that the Laudato Si, it's like an, like an implicit prescription for a steady state economy. It really is. Okay, now uh, just a few words about optimal scale, because we talked about, uh, you know, the sustainable alternative being the steady state economy, but does that mean we want to establish it at whatever this level of GDP is, like say today's level? And, uh, you know, so it's a question of what's the optimal level. And at CASI, we, we think that this is one of the biggest questions for democracy in the 21st century. How do we, you know, meld these wildly divergent thoughts on what would be the right size of GDP into an optimal level. Uh, because if, you, if you're sort of a biocentric type like myself, I love the, the wilderness. I love wildlife. That's why I became a wildlife biologist. And he, eventually I, I cared enough about it to move into ecological macroeconomics because I could see that there that uh, wildlife conservation as a profession was an ex it's an exercise in futility as long as the overriding domestic policy goal is GDP growth. So uh, that's how people from biology end up into ecological economics. But you know, there are many other people that they don't, they're afraid to go out into wild kind. They don't really, they feel they don't have much of a need to see anything like that at all, even on TV. They'd like the whole world to be maybe in New York City or Mexico City or Beijing. And so, you know, it's a huge challenge for democracy. Uh, but if 
for any democracy that wants to give it a try, there certainly are some metrics that are helpful in doing that. Uh, G you start with GDP, sure, to tell you the size of the economy, kind of like a, a patient that you want to assess the health of. You, they need to step on the scale first. That's one of the first measures, but then other things like the blood pressure cuff comes out and the, you know, the stethoscope. And so analogously, we have the ecological footprint, the living planet index, the human development index. There's a bunch of them out there. Ultimately, I think they're all, uh, people are starting to realize in some parts of the world that what we're really after is this thing we might call gross national happiness. And these things just help us figure out if we're getting closer or further from this. And I want to say that, you know, when we look at these variables today, well, I think we need to start being alarmed. I want to share one last thing with you uh, in the furtherance of that alarm. And this comes from, from our homepage at steadystate.org. And, uh, you know, you see our, some of our themes and so on, but it tells you at the top that an economy as big as this is a threat to these things. And then if you go click on our rolling GDP meter, which by the way, happens to be going downhill yet right now during the COVID caused recession, but it's still way, way over bloated. And of course, everybody in, on earth practically, except a few uh, exceptions among countries, is planning on turning this thing back around and jacking it back up, you know, uh, perpetually. Uh, so let's take a look at the results of that kind of thing. And, and, and uh, here it is. So that's what I'd like to leave you with. And, uh, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, we've been listening to <clears throat> Brian Check talking with us about uh, the impact of the economy and particularly the mantra of growth as the uh, one political solution that is offered to all kinds of um, economic problems is challenged that thinking at a very fundamental level. And you might be thinking about it and wanting to uh, pose questions that maybe challenge him back or cheer him on in terms of uh, the core of his argument. We're gonna start though with a uh, response from Saul Katz. Uh, Saul is uh, now retired from the University of Pennsylvania in the field of anthropology, really one of the most distinguished uh, scholars in that field over the past few decades. Uh, his um, most interesting work, uh, at least uh, for some of you, will be his, uh, his effort to understand the uh, cultural evolution of uh, alcoholic beverages, wine and beer. And he's written uh, widely on that uh, and uh, absolutely fascinating work. At a more, let's say, what, um, urgent note, he is also one of the world's experts on uh, global hunger particularly hunger as it uh, afflicts the poorest of the uh, world's population in, uh, let's say, sub-Saharan Africa and in other places. Uh, no surprise to Brian and to others that sometimes the plight of the needy is turned into an argument for growth. Helping us sort through that, uh, we go now to Saul Katz,
Uh, Saul, go ahead and unmute and um, uh, go ahead and pose your question to Brian. And once you've done that, uh, Brian will uh, answer you directly. I think it's... Can you hear me now? We can hear you, Saul. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to uh, respond to you, Brian. I think that you've uh, challenged us in many different ways for this uh, presentation. So I'm, I, there are a number of things that I agree with. Of course, I agree with the, with the uh, ecological approach that you've used. I uh, have used that myself over, over, uh, but well over, believe it or not, for well over 60 years. Um, so I've been involved in that for a very long time. But uh, I also have been involved and seen a lot of different things come and go along the way. And I'm deeply impressed with your attempts to make economics accessible to, to everyone. And I think that's a very important issue because most of the economists out there don't bother to do that. In fact, it's sort of uh, one of these disciplines that, that tends, not everybody in it, but, but a good number of people do it just as a professional activity along the lines that you critique. So I am uh, concerned about that. And uh, I think that one of the things, of course, that I'll just ask you about is, is to what degree uh, to the professionals that you interact with in the field, um, uh, how do they look at your work? That's just an interesting side of this, of this issue, but I think it's important for us to sort of understand that. Um, a second uh, thing that I think is really important um, uh, is not more of a question, but just a comment that the, uh, the, your ending, uh, your ending uh, goes from, from accelerated uh, um, you might say pollution of the system uh, through overproduction, overconsumption, and the net effect of that is of the degradation that is occurring. And the climate change degradation that's occurring now is at an extreme level. And then the only reason and you point out that it's, that it's uh, slowed down is because COVID has interrupted the ordinary flow of, of goods and services. And that in itself has, been a disruption. So my question is, where do you see COVID as a clear disruption? Uh, is COVID a dress rehearsal for what you expect to occur uh, down the road as, as climate change accelerates with the poles melting, water level rising, carbon dioxide into the oceans and the pH increasing to acidification? And of course, all of the things that are happening on land from the desiccation, fires, desiccation and crop uh, failures or extreme weather where, where the crop failures are due to uh, wind damage and, all, and rain damage, uh, et cetera, and around the world. So this is a very big question, very primary, a very primary interest of mine because that's what I work with. I still chair a international task force for the American Anthropology Association on world food problems and have done so for about the last 12 years or so. So I think overall though, I think that you're asking us to do a whole set of new things to look a new set of tools to come up with to evaluate how we could possibly integrate what you have to say into a new model of, of uh, of steady state. And the new bubble of steady state requires a great deal of, of testing and retesting to be sure that we're on the right track. Because once we go on the track that I would suggest that you're advocating, we may be down a, a pathway with very few returns. So I'm concerned about the degree to which you want to change the system and how you would expect that to occur. So let me give you some examples of that now. Um, one is, uh, you have a priorities list in your mind about uh, the, the way in which the change has to occur. In other words, you can't do it instantly. It's not a switch. 
although COVID in some respects has provided a switch. Um, but what is the what are the priorities that you would give on how what would be the order of changes that you would recommend to start to move in the direction toward the lower GDP that would be uh, in a steady state function? How would that work? Would you, for example, would you get rid of in the economic terms, the uh, concept of negative externalities. You know what that is, but I'll explain it to everybody else for a moment. If I produce, uh, let's say I'm a steel producer, if I produce the steel, uh, I run blast furnaces and there's a lot of pollution from that, but I don't feel, I don't figure that cost into my price of the steel that somebody else is gonna come along and build a bridge from it or a building from it. Instead, that's negatively externalized the, the cost of that into the environment and everybody pays for that. And that's exactly what we see uh, all across the boards and many different businesses are based upon unregulated negative externalities that uh, damage our environment and may reduce the capacity to, to recover. Right now we've passed the tipping point for a number of the issues of climate change, which need to be addressed as well. So. I'd like to think. I'd like you to think about what's your priority list on that. Another thing is that you talk a lot about sustainability and sustainable, uh, and everybody's talking about it. And I'm, I'm concerned: is the word going to become hackneyed, or is it going to still may become still useful? And I worry that the advertising industry is already uh, using the word sustainable for everything. It's like green is out, but sustainable is in. Uh, but my point to you is. How long in the future do you think that's, how do you evaluate sustainability in the future text? Let me give you an example uh, from my anthropological experience. The Iroquois nation that, that uh, made peace with the United States in its, in its founding back in, I live in Philadelphia where all this took place. Um, and they had, had a concept that, uh, that any policy decision that they made for the Iroquois nations, this is a series of nations uh, of American Indians, the North of us basically, um, and uh, any decision they made had to be thought of for its effects seven generations into the future. So it's a huge long-term uh, theme invested in that. And the question I have is what is your time dimension? How do you figure that time dimension into the, the uh, system. And that brings another point into, into focus, which is you bring in the question of religion and science into this. And I think one of the principal contributions that, that religion and science and the religious communities of the world can provide for us is a system of values. How do we use the system of values that we have that is, that is embedded and highly evolved within all of the religious traditions of the world to uh, uh, can we use that and how can we use it to the, the system of values to attain the kind of balance that we need, rebalance that we need for, the, uh, for a sustainable uh, system to exist. And then the final thing I'll just say, try to try and be brief about this, you, you have a number of critiques of the technology side of things. I, I don't necessarily buy your, um, I do buy what you said about the, the application of the technology into the system. I understand the economics of that and all the different things and, and uh, that, but what I don't catch is, is that there is, you make the point that there's, that's the information technology, for example, doesn't have, um, doesn't add much, but I would argue that's at the fundamental base of the trophic system that you talk about. Uh, they're all based upon informational macromolecules, DNA and RNA that, that underlie how, how the whole uh, system evolved in the earth way before humans throughout all of the life forms. So I'm suggesting that, that at the heart of it, we could look at the entire world, the global system as an information system. And as such, with the technologies that have, have been developed to, to access and transmit and, and integrate information into the way we think, uh, we have an enormous potential from these things. And there are other technologies that are similar, which also have added you know, um, uh, to our capacities. And, and right now, the best hope we have of continuing to feed people in the world is gonna be the synthesis of 
traditional values along with with technically improved um, uh, various crops that, that have been technically improved. I don't think they, they necessarily have to be genetically engineered, but I'm not against that either. I think that the important point is, is that there's something going on that is multiplicative, exponentially multiplicative in the capacity of technologies to make a huge difference in the, in the direction of minimizing the footprint that we now have in order to attain a better steady state. So I would argue that's a, a primary theme and I'd like you to address that as well. So those are my, I have other comments too. You know, listen, I'm an anthropologist. I could talk about Mesopotamia ad infinitum here uh, and just say it about cuneiform writing. I will only say in passing, I suppose I have to say this in defense of the, the Mesopotamians, they invited, invented writing and writing is the major invention of, 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 of uh, yes, it's true uh, what they did with, with their technology of money, but the real issue was all the original records were about trade, about the, the Mesopotamians invented that as a system of informa information storage, if you will, so they would know exactly what they were doing. And it was trade that was accelerating the whole process throughout the world. And, and that's something you haven't necessarily addressed. How do you take from one to the other and back and forth? And how does that uh, uh, make a, a, a difference in the end? Anyway, these are, these are, you don't have to respond to that at all because that's, uh, uh, that's maybe another whole world. I think I've given enough questions. So try these for size. Thank you, by, by the way, for all your stimulating presentation. Thank you, Saul. Wow, I'm glad I had a notebook to <laughs> monitor <laughs> that. Seems to me uh, we've got uh, at least eight distinct questions there and a number of sub-questions. Maybe I'll start with the end and kind of work backwards because I, I felt that was a very compelling observation uh, about the information uh, sector, like we could call it. And uh, <clears throat> I agree with you. In fact, I, I have at times given talks about, uh, I forgot what the title was, something like, uh, there never was, in, there, there's no such thing as an information economy and or there's always been an information economy. And you're right about, you know, the evolution of DNA, for example, uh, that's information. I also like to think of it in terms of some of the earlier humans, you know, like uh, during the Pleistocene, for example, when uh, you know, the Beringians were migrating eastward and thenceforth to populate North America and they used information nonstop. They read mammoth tracks and they you know, they kept their nose to the wind and they kept their eyes to the sky to gather all this information about which way to go, when, and, and how to handle life. <clears throat> so it was information all the time. That's why I'm such a critic of the information services, the information economy. There's nothing fundamentally new at all about it. However, uh, unlike your conceptual model of it, I wouldn't really put information at the base of the trophic structure. I would put it as many other service sectors like transportation, insurance, and a number of others as woven throughout the trophic levels, which are the agro extractive sectors at the base, and then the manufacturing sectors from heaviest to lightest. Uh, and I also want to say, about information that we always have to ask ourselves, what's the information gonna be used for? Because if it's not gonna be used for those agro extractive and manufacturing and other service sectors, is it really gonna get past the invisible hand in the marketplace and be relevant to the topic of economic growth? So I don't see information as any sort of a way to get out of limits to growth or the fundamental conflict between economic growth and environmental protection 
because economic growth requires that expanding trophic base, including with the information that feeds into it. Uh, you asked about whether the word sustainable is still very useful. I, mean, I, I guess I could paraphrase, or is it becoming kind of a buzzword and maybe even co-opted? I think so. But I think, you know, among a certain number of us, uh, you can see through the, the use of it, whether it's being used in its uh, Webster's Dictionary sense of, you know, long, lasting for a long time, uh, or whether it's being used as propaganda. So, you know, I, we try not to overuse it, uh, but it does have a very succinct meaning in the vernacular, and so we like to use it where it fits. I really liked your question about what, what would be the order of the reforms that we would propose at CASI. And uh, we do have an ordering, and we all have different opinions about that, but uh, I would say the prevailing one at the moment, and, uh, and my, in, in my opinion, the first order of business is to have the right goal. Because we don't feel that many of the other reforms are going to amount to much at all in the long run uh, unless we have the right goal as the the overarching context for all the other reforms and by that i mean we have to abandon the notion of perpetual gdp growth and all, and recognize that already now not already now for some time now a lot of the the research on this indicates that maybe as early as the 1950s some would say 50s through the 70s, somewhere in that range, growth started going bad. You know, growth helped before then. It started causing more problems than it solved at some point after that. And so now, you know, we're way beyond that, that 50 some years, 50, 60, 70 years beyond that. So we, uh, our central legislative project at CASI is what we call the Full and Sustainable Employment Act. You know, if we have a central economic policy in the United States, and I would say we do, it's the Employment Act. And uh, that thing, it was adopted in 1946. And then the only major amendments were in 1978. And it became uh, the Full Employment and Balanced Growth Act. And that was the point that got the U.S. government even a thoroughly whole hog into GDP growth. So now we feel uh, another 50 years later, it's time for sweeping amendments, starting with the preamble where Congress finds and declares that economic growth was a great thing through much of history and that economic growth is causing this and that and the other problem. And for long-term uh, welfare of of the United States of America and her citizens. We need to stop that process of, of growth, harm causing growth and transition to the steady state economy. And then we're working on this already. We have a number of uh, fiscal and monetary policies that go with that, uh, the full, we call it the full seas act for short because it almost fits uh, with the acronym FSEA, the Full and Sustainable Employment Act, but also we're we uh, you know we're using the the metaphor of the rising tide lifts all boats. That was a great metaphor for the 20th century, but now you know there's no more water to raise the tide except for you know the the eustatic sea level rise from from the warming of the waters. Not that kind of, yeah, but there's no more you know aqua for water to feed that basic trophic level. And there is no more boat building material metaphorically, and there's not enough room out on the seas for the boats. So we call it the full seas act. The seas are full, time to stabilize things. And uh, so all kinds of uh, tax reforms would go in there for stabilizing uh, both population and per capita consumption. We have a stance on immigration. I'll say it in a nutshell. We're, uh, we're for tightening borders, but only 
after the United States says that we have, we're undertaking this transition away from growth as the goal to a steady state as the goal. Because prior to that, it would be really stupid diplomatically to have tightened down borders because then you look like a greedy hog at the trough. And so we just think that that's a uh, very uh, poor diplomacy and bound to backfire. Well, I've been jabbering on for quite a while now. I don't, do I have any more time to answer questions or uh, should we let it phase into the Q&A session? Uh, Brian, you should feel comfortable uh, maybe taking a couple more minutes. Um, I, I do have a queue of questions, but uh, if you want to respond to anything else that Saul has said, uh, another minute or two. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. Sure. Uh, then, uh, well, Saul asked about what our time frame is at Cassie when we think about, I guess, like economic planning, for example. And believe it or not, Saul, that is our uh, our time frame. Seven generations. We we adopted that from you know. I think there are a number of Native American claims to that. I know where I grew up in Wisconsin uh, with the Oneida. I right on the edge of the Oneida Reservation, uh, and actually they were part of uh, originally the Iroquois and and the. Uh, Iroquois nation, I guess. But in any event, yes, yeah, seven generations, we uh, equate that to approximately 150 years. And it's a very, very commonsensical ecological macroeconomic time frame. It's not so minuscule as to be uh, horribly discounting of the future. And yet it's not so far off as to be, you know, meaningless to practically everybody walking around now. It's kids and grandkids and great grandkids and, and uh, you know, not too much beyond that. It's a very, very great uh, period of time for uh, macroeconomic planning at this stage when we have these huge issues that are that stem from overgrowth like climate change and biodiversity collapse. And, uh, and what about forever pollutants? Are we are we even keeping track of which ones are uh, potentially uh, existential threats? Where they're coming from? Uh, you know, so the the growth the growth process has a lot of perils that we're not even able to keep up in terms of the monitoring. Uh, I did want to mention that when I worked for the US Fish and Wildlife Service from 1999 to 2017, before I signed on full-time with Cassie, For a lot of that time, I was the climate change coordinator for the National Wildlife Refuge System. And by that, uh, that, I, that wasn't technically my title. I was like the de facto climate change coordinator before they developed the job description that largely was designed around the things that I had been doing. Like I had been uh, coordinating our modeling of sea level rise. As, and, and I always insisted on pointing out in things like introductions to, to reports that sea level rise is a function of global warming, is a function of GDP growth, just like the IPCC points out in their scenarios reports. And that got me in hot water, so to speak, because uh, in the government, you're not allowed to even talk about things like limits to growth and the fundamental conflict between economic growth and environmental protection. So that's one of the reasons I finally quit. I just couldn't take that anymore. I had, I had a gag order. I was not allowed to talk about, to even mention the phrase economic growth toward the end. I wasn't even allowed to, to use the phrase. <laughs> so, uh, uh, well, those were some great questions that Saul had, and uh, hopefully I got to at least some of the, the ones that I was better able to deal with. <laughs>
Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Brian. We've been listening to Brian Check responding to Saul Katz. It's now time to uh, open up the program for questions from uh, uh, anyone in the audience. Some of you have already typed in your question. What you do is you go down to the bottom center of the screen, open the Q&A box, and type your question in there. I've got a little bit of a queue of questions. I think we'll be able to work through um, most of them at least. Uh, we'll, we'll try uh, to do that. But um, it, it's, there's still room for you to add a question or two to the, to the list. Um, so one of the obvious questions to occur to a number of people has to do with the relationship between growth and population. And in fact, I think I, to expedite things, let me connect this with another uh, question. Uh, Saul asked, uh, so what are the steps here? Somebody else asked a very similar question, but I think uh, the, the, the question really is, how do you persuade people? What are the persuasional or rhetorical steps? And it seems to me that one of the key persuasional or rhetorical steps needs to be a global conversion about, po uh, about uh, population. Um, that bumps us up into religion, it bumps us up against other factors, but um, obviously population growth fuels economic growth or, or does it? Um, and if it does, how do you persuade people? How do you persuade the peoples of the world to make significant changes in population growth? Okay, that is, that's a really important and loaded question. And um, first of all, to your last sentence, it does really depend on which part of the world you're in, because it matters a lot what the religious matrix is like. Uh, and going back to the beginning of your, your, that set of questions, you might say, yeah, population is very fundamental to GDP growth. You know, uh, the size of the economy basically is population times per capita consumption. And uh, you may have heard of the IPAT formula, environmental impact equals population times affluence, and then considering technology, IPAT. And I think that you've heard more about technology today than, the, than you will find in the, the old IPAT literature. But any, anyway, um, uh, we take the approach in the USA. Cassie, we're centered in the US and most of our efforts are at the national level. But we do have efforts ranging from local to global. We have chapters worldwide and we have local chapters scattered around. Uh, we take the, the basic approach in the US though that we don't want to start with population as the issue to persuade people that we need to change because of the religious uh, context or matrix in the United States. Uh, for example, there's a, a very uh, prominent Catholic community and, <clears throat> and uh, population is not something you wade into without tremendous respect and diplomacy and theology and and we never see that among you know like we hardly ever see that among population activists out there and when you don't have that tremendous amount of respect and caution then what happens you sort of instantly uh cause this knee-jerk reaction or oh, you, you know about being uh uh, anti, anti Catholic or, or, or against the, the principles of, of the church. But we, uh, say that it's not that difficult to understand the impact of more and more stuff out there. And, and that's a very secular matter. GDP and the policy of GDP growth is a very secular policy. <clears throat> It's, a, it's not just uh, something that's talked about on the nightly news, you know, stock markets and GDP. 
it's policy. That's why I mentioned the Full Employment and Balance Growth Act. You know, we have a policy of GDP growth. And we feel that there's nothing taboo about, uh, you know, limits to GDP, about talking about limits to GDP or the conflict between GDP growth and these really important things, environmental protection and, and long-term jobs and national security and international stability. So we say, let's lead with GDP talk. Eventually when it gets serious enough, population will plop out of the bag and we gotta deal with it seriously, like in the tax code. Uh, with your income credit reform and stuff like that. Okay, now in a place like China, <clears throat> it's not obviously, it's obviously not the case. You can start with population and in, in, in a number of other Asian countries. And so it's very uh, region sensitive, we think. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. And I think uh, your comments earlier along the way in the talk about uh, Pope Francis and Laudato Si, uh, you obviously see something in that that uh, is, well, a, a, an offsetting value um, uh, that uh, points people of religious faith toward other goods uh, other than material consumption. Uh, and I, I suppose uh, your, your uh, work uh, would echo that, uh, that it's uh, a good life is not measured just by material consumption. But let me, let me uh, you, you mentioned uh, China, for instance, at least one of the questioners has posed a question related to China. Their GDP is growing faster than ours. Suppose you're successful, suppose the US uh, tamps down or um, uh, moves away from uh, 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 GDP growth. Uh, that would be instantly consigning ourselves to number two uh, uh, as a global economic power. Um, the questioner doesn't ask this, but this pops into my mind. Uh, try selling that to the American people uh, that, that we want deliberately to be uh, number two. Or if, if we're not comparing ourselves to China, how do we compare ourselves to even more challenging situations in which some countries are so far behind. Uh, how, how do we level this out globally? What does it mean for countries that perhaps overconsume, um, take up a, a larger than uh, per capita share of GDP globally, and um, uh, and what 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 room does that leave for the poorest of the countries to still pursue some level of growth? Um, all right, so country by country, how do, how do you think about GDP growth? Okay, well, I'd like to start with the case of USA versus China and who's number one, who's number two. <laughs> you know, this is the big paradigm shift. We're trying to help precipitate the paradigm shift of the 21st century is that GDP growth is no longer a sign of success. It may be in some cases, but it's not across the board. And so uh, do we have anybody out there that's trying to be number one by weighing the most out of anybody in the world? You know, that would be really uh, unhealthy and, and not very smart. And it's, it's a good metaphor, I think, for an economy. An economy can get overgrown. Too many people, too much stuff, too much harm. And uh, so if, if anybody wants to think of a country as being number one because it's got the greatest GDP, let them. It's gonna <laughs> backfire soon enough, you know, and everybody's gonna recognize it. It's sheer uh, ignorance to think that way. Um, now, the uh, thing about China that we should recognize is at least, they've been a little bit honest about the perils of pushing for perpetual GDP growth, much more honest than the USA. Uh, China has in recent years, I think more than once, modified their GDP growth goals explicitly, intentionally, because 
for, for the stated reason that that rapid growth was causing too much environmental harm. Now, obviously those interests in China haven't prevailed entirely. They, they're still very uh, hell bent on GDP growth, but they, they have at least shown the ability to talk about the reality of that trade-off. You don't see that in American politics at a level higher than, you know, <laughs> very low. So to the other part of your question, you know, earlier today, well, I'm not gonna mention the country, but I was on a call with uh, some nationals from an African nation, I can say that much. And uh, they are very interested in establishing a leadership role in saying that, look, we're unlike the rest of the countries that are in many cases working with China on the Belt and Road projects. Um, we're taking the stance that we don't want outside capital coming in here, pushing us around, taking our resources and hiring us so cheaply. We want to manage our own economy and we recognize that it can't be perpetual. We have a tiny, relatively tiny GDP per capita, but we're saying it's time to stabilize GDP and stabilize our population. Now they haven't gotten there yet, but this is a, you know, a, a relatively high level. There could be, a, you know, the leader of the country making these points in the foreseeable future, and that that's a huge step in what we call steady statesmanship. That's the application of steady state economics in international diplomacy. So we, you know, we do have kind of a vision for steady statesmanship that entails at some stage uh, the convention on economic sustainability, which was kind of a international out, uh, outboarding or internationally uh, relative uh, or linked project with the with our full and sustainable employment act but you know either one of those could operate independently for that matter but we hope that they are related thank you yeah very very interesting um we got another question that just came in on um catholic statements uh not just laudato c but the uh, more recent uh, Fratelli Tutti, which uh, translates kind of badly, but I guess we could translate it for purposes here as uh, human solidarity, human conviviality. Um, but here's, uh, here's the question from John. Uh, uh, Brian's references to La Dato Si seem very appropriate and suggestive of a common basis of concern with some widespread religious perspectives has the consideration of, quote, profits versus true prosperity, end of quote, reached into the provisions of Fratelli Tutti. And I, and I don't know, Brian, if you've seen this new encyclical just uh, out within the past uh, few weeks, reached into the provisions of uh, Fratelli Tutti and its suggestion that pursuit of profit as a sine qua non deforms the proper goal of economic activity. Let me re read that last bit. It's suggestion that the pursuit of profit as, as, as the one and only goal deforms the proper goal of economic activity. Right. Well, so there are a lot of the critics and criticism of capitalism uh, rides along next to us who are critics of economic growth <clears throat> because capitalism does tend by its nature to be very pro-growth. But on the other hand, you know, so was the Soviet pilot bureau. Yeah, and so our it's a little bit similar to that earlier question about do we lead with population or GDP or consumption. 
because it depends on what the part of the world you're in, you know, the, the history, the culture, the ecosystem. Uh, there are very different types of economies operating in tropical versus, you know, temperate versus uh, polar kinds of, of ecosystems. Uh, so we, uh, 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 I, I'm not familiar with the Protelli Tutte and, and I, it's something I'm gonna look into. I appreciate hearing about it. I, I would say that I'm very encouraged that this Pope Francis, number one, that he took the name Francis. That tells us a lot right there. Uh, and he appears on covers, you know, with scenes of nature. And like I say, the Laudato Si is uh, like, a, like an implicit prescription for a steady state economy. And clearly this Pope is also against the, uh, the, the hellish trappings of unbridled capitalism. Well, we've pushed uh, up to and a little bit over our stated hour. But let me close us with one question that uh, asks you, Brian, to kind of reflect on the passage of time over the past few decades and possibly then to project on into the next decade or so. Uh, the, the question comes from uh, Ted, uh, who asks about the uh, early 70s and the Club of Rome limits of growth. Uh, how influential was that in your thinking? Uh, what uh, major differences mark your thinking over against that? Uh, in other words, how, how, we, how, how have we learned some new things since then? Um, but uh, reflect, kind of sit back for just the final moment and reflect on how this whole project seems to be uh, moving along. Uh, you're up against some pretty powerful forces, uh, political leaders on both sides. Uh, you're up against some pretty powerful forces. Uh, how is this uh, going to catch on and win the hearts and minds of enough people before it just becomes too damn late? Well, you know what we have on our side and I, say this toward the end about just about every talk I'm giving now for the last couple of years is we have two really powerful allies that sound science and common sense. <laughs> you know, all the, the, this notion that there's no limited growth on a finite planet and, and uh, that, you know, that there is no conflict between growing the economy and protecting the environment. All you got to do is look around. Everybody knows there's a conflict. The, the thing is that I, I take that back. Not everybody knows there's a conflict because they're not out there looking with a critical eye at what's happening. If they did, their common sense would be engaged and they would see that conflict. Uh, but also there is uh, there's neoclassical economics and there's dark money. You know, the dark money... Uh, which was very well explained by the book in the book, Dark Money, the intentional propagation of this notion of perpetual growth and this notion that you can have your cake and eat it too, that there is no conflict between growing. Economy. And unfortunately in the U S that sort of ran in parallel with both political parties talk about things like the environment and the economy. So uh, I'll never forget how prominent that win-win that rhetoric was in the Clinton administrations in the 90s. That, uh, there is no conflict between growing the economy and protecting the environment. So um, uh, going back to the earlier part of that question in reflecting upon like what's happened since the 70s. And uh, yeah, my own thinking on this was greatly influenced by the book Limits to Growth. But even more so, I would say, by the works of Herman Daly, who is such a, a brilliant, uh, this, uh, brilliant author in describing why. Uh, 
there are limits and using just enough of his uh, uh, very potent body of knowledge in thermodynamics and in economics, distilling that for the lay reader. And I've tried to do some of the same in my books, you know, like uh, shoveling fuel for a runaway train, which you mentioned, I really distilled and down and brought in also, you know, the, the, this, these concepts from ecology, like trophic levels and so on. But in any, of, in any event, uh, that's how I got into this, more from the works by Herman, because my PhD research uh, was a policy analysis of the Endangered Species Act. And I was looking at the causes of species endangerment in the United States. And they were like a who's who of the American economy, the causes of endangerment. So then I started looking for literature, economic growth and wildlife, economic growth and environment. And there was hardly any, especially about economic growth and wildlife. Uh, and, but finally I found Herman Daly's stuff. And so, but what happened, I think, historically in the U.S. was the very success of Limits to Growth, Silent Spring, uh, Population Bomb, I suppose, would be in there as well. And then Herman Daly's books and writings. What happened was uh, big money started to see that as a threat and big money started to evolve in some quarters into dark money, you know, with the Koch brothers and so on. And, and all the money that got that trickled out into various academic departments, various think tanks, and various political campaigns to lead people to think that, that there is no conflict between growing the economy and protecting the environment. And it, it's had real heavy duty harm for the American polity. I'm telling you, I was gagged for most of my 18 years with the US Fish and Wildlife. I kept fighting back. Uh, a, a supervisor would, would go to a different place. I'd try it again and get re-gagged. <laughs> and so uh, the win-win the rhetoric as propagated first by big money and then even dark money, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very tough thing to defeat, but I think it will be defeated. We'll defeat it. We'll all defeat it because we have sound science and common sense on our side. And I'll say one last thing about it, the environmental and number of people won't like this, but I gotta say it, a number of the big environmental NGOs, I'm gonna say most of them, have totally failed us on this. In fact, some of them went whole hog into with the win-win rhetoric that you can have your cake and eat it too. The Nature Conservancy did that. They've done that for decades now. You have your cake and eat it too. Uh, Natural Resources Defense Council went into that. Uh, the National Wildlife Federation was heavily for a certain amount of time into the win-win rhetoric. And uh, so was Defenders of Wildlife. So we, we have to hold them to account and get them to do their part in providing leadership that uh, pursuant to the, the sound science and the common sense that we can't have a perpetually growing GDP. And the more we push for GDP growth, the faster we're pulling out the rug from those seven generations. Well, thank you so much, Brian, Jack. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for sharing with us tonight.